Yeah, I <coughs> went eight when God called Abram. And um, he called Moses right about when he was 80 to get up and do some great work for him. So about the right age. Corporate prayer is important, you know, we, we need to get together and pray for each other, lift one another up. Good reminder, better of um, Lazarus, and Jesus wept. Even though he was going to bring him out, he didn't pray for him anymore, or weep. He prayed and Jesus wept is the shortest word of verse of the Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 through 4. The weather's come down a little bit. Uh, not as hot as it was. I think it's going to have a few more hot spells. And we'll be back to somewhat of the uh, fall weather. I heard about this elderly, a uh, few elderly ladies were driving down the freeway. And they were pulled over by a police officer who asked the elderly lady, you know, why are you driving so slow on this road? And she replied, well, I'm not going slow at all. Matter of fact, I'm going as for the posted sign. The officer laughed and said, oh no, madam, that number is the highway number, highway 25, you know. That's not the speed limit. And then he noticed how all her passengers looked so scared so the officer asked her as to why all the passengers in her car were looking so scared. To which she replied, because we just got off of Highway 95. <laughs> it'll, it'll get <laughs> when you and I were children, there's a saying we often hear. I want to say the first half of the saying, let's see if you know the second half. Cross my heart and oh, die. <laughs> die. Yeah. What, what was that child saying? They were saying they made a promise. And if they were to break the promise, they would expect something bad to happen. The original phrase is a little bit longer. Cross my heart and hope to die. Stick a needle in my eye, yeah. The, the only thing kids could think of that's worse than dying was sticking needles in their eye. And I tend to agree. You see, kids understand the importance of promises. And um, in fact, parents have learned that they need to be very careful what promises they make to their kids. As my kids were growing up, I learned that if I told them that I was going to do something, um, for example, if I said I was going to take them to some place or I was going to get something for them, and then for whatever reason I didn't do that, you know what they say to me? But you promised. promised yes. <laughs> and as children, we learned that promises are important and needed to be kept. Now, God understands that. And so he repeatedly tells us throughout the Bible that if he makes a promise, he'll keep it. Amen? Amen. And in the Bible, one of the most significant kind of promises God made were called covenants. You see, a covenant was the kind of promise that God made with Abram, for example. Abram who was later renamed Abraham. And in that covenant, God promised Abraham that if he left his home and took his family to a place where God would show him, then God would bless him in several significant ways. You see, there are some people who think that the Old Testament covenants are like our modern day contracts. And that's kind of true. But to put it in perspective, or to be precise, covenants were more like contracts 
on steroids. <laughs> they really, you know, have, have, have a binding um, nature. You see, back in the Bible days, folks um, talked about cutting a covenant. But what do they mean when they say cutting a covenant? Cutting a covenant means like if you if you cut a covenant with someone, you would go through a, a elaborate ceremony where you would um, cut an animal in two, and uh, the parts were placed a few feet apart, the, and and create a path between them, the pieces of, of between the pieces of the dead animal. Then the parties of the covenant, the covenant would walk between those those dead parts, and that, in that they were essentially saying. May I be like this dead animal if I ever break this covenant? And the Bible declares through Genesis 15 that that is how God cut his covenant with Abraham. And here's how the Bible puts it in Genesis 15, 9 through 10, and, and 17, 18 through 19. It says, And the Lord said to him, Bring me a heifer, a goat, and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pig. Abram brought all these to him, cut it two, and arranged the halves opposite each other. When the sun had set and the darkness had fallen, a smoking firepot and a blazing torch representing God appeared and passed between those pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham. You see, God was making a solid declaration to Abram. In that, you see, his covenant was no child's play. It was serious. Uh, you know, it's a serious vow. And it was God's way of saying, I will keep my promise. Amen. Has God made you a promise? You know, people people do their walk with God know that God has made them a promise of something amazing, something good. But you're beginning to wonder about it. Has God made you a promise? You see, the, people, people may, or people will let you down with their inability to fulfill a promise. But not God. Right. If God said he would deliver, make no mistake of it, the delivery is right on schedule and will be here no matter the odds. Amen? Amen. So I, I don't remind you this evening, but the amazing God, a nature of God who always fulfills his promises, even how, no matter how bleak it looked, uh, Abraham was 75 years old, you know. Um, see, knowing about God's promises is important for us. For two reasons. Number one, you see, whenever God makes a promise, He intends to keep it. You see, covenants were God's way of dramatically driving home uh, how serious His promises were. That's what the covenant was all about. And how committed God was to fulfilling what He's promised. And the Bible says in um, Isaiah 46, 11, it says, What I have said, that I will bring to pass. What I have planned, that will I do. If I said it, He said, I'll do it. And nobody can stop me, nothing. In other words, if I said it, I will definitely do it. The Bible says in uh, 2 Corinthians 1, 20, it says, no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. See, the promise that God has made to you in all of your living, according to the Bible, the promise is, it is yes. God's made you a promise, and it's a yes. When God makes a promise, he'll keep his end of the God will keep his promises. And his promises, uh, you know, here in Genesis 12, were exciting to Abraham, you know? Because uh, it should be exciting to us as well. Because Abraham was a man who wasn't all that different from us. Think about it. Abraham was 75 years old. God called him then. 75-year-old Abraham. And the Bible says, very little about anything he had done all during those 75 years. If you were to write a resume, it wasn't that impressive of a resume for Abraham. He's not known as a, as a great warrior. He's not a great theologian. And he's apparently not much of a writer either. You know, there's no the book of Abraham. There, there isn't like anything like that in the Bible. 
You know, there are no Bible books written by him. And yet, Abraham was one of the greatest men of the Old Testament. Only Jesus and maybe Moses are more highly regarded in the Bible than Abraham's. And, but what did Abraham do that was worthy of such importance? I mean, until he was 75, if you look at his life, you know, really not that impressive. He wasn't doing anything great. But at 75, after God called him, you know, he became one of the greatest people. You know, what, what, was, what was that that did? The answer is found in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. The Bible says, The Lord had said to Abram, Leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land that I will show you. That's it. You see, God asked him to pack up his tent and go to a place he's never been to, and what? Abraham backed up his tent, puts his wife on a camel. Do you have a camel? <laughs> and, and off he goes. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8 through 10, the, the, the book of faith, but the chapter of faith. It says, by faith Abraham had called to go to a place he would later receive, receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went. Even though he did not know where he was going, by faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign land. He lived in tents as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him on the same promise. The Bible says, for he was looking forward to a city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. What does that mean? It means that, look, the place and the promise that God was saying, God saying, I'm preparing. He's the architect. He's going to make it happen. He's going to design it. He's going to make all those things. So when God promises, the entire thing that God has promised, He's the architect and the builder. You know, He says, I'm going to design this. I'm going to put it together. He's the architect and the builder. And Abraham knew. He went. He, he left everything on that one word and took off. But that is it. You know, to Abraham's credit, there's nothing else written in the Bible about some great thing that he did. God says move. And he moves. You know what? To tell you the truth, as much as you can think about it and pray about it, it doesn't sound particularly impressive to me. And maybe to you too. You know, it's like God said move and he moved. Well, yeah. that's the most impressive thing. And yet God sets Abraham, you know, up to be one of the major heroes in the Bible. All he did was, when God said, boom, he moved. Just because he moved, that's it. What's so impressive about that, you might say? You and I both want to know what was so impressive about Abraham moving to another place after God told him to move. You want to know that, don't you? But what was so impressive about was that Abraham was a man, as the Bible says, who believed God. Now, in your walk with God, you will rely on all kinds of other things. But the Bible talks about it. You see, Abraham, he trusted God. He had faith in God. The question this evening is, do you? The Bible says in Romans chapter 4, verse 9, Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. Now, in a way, that should excite us. And the reason is that it should excite us is because that means we don't have to be important in this world for God to want to use us. We don't have to have an impressive resume for God to want to work in our lives. You know, Abraham didn't, didn't have any. There was no impressive resume at all. Matter of fact, there was nothing to write. We don't have to be strong or smart or rich or powerful. All we have to do is trust God. The entirety of your Christian walk is to trust God. Believe in God, have faith in God. Because He is true to His promises. Amen? Amen. Amen. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9, memorize this verse. It will come in handy whenever you are in tough circumstances. Here's what the Bible says in 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9. It says, for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. God is looking and searching to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. He says, you be loyal to me, I'll figure it. 
He's the architect and the builder. He takes, he designs it. He said, there's nothing like that over there. Yeah, he's the architect, he'll design it. And who's going to make it all happen? God will. You trust him enough, is the question. To let him work in your life. Because, you know, we might say yes to that question, but when, when the rubber meets the road, as you go along life, you've got to be able to take that situation, that impossible situation, that impossible thing that's been, that's been uh, haunting you, and give it to the Lord. Even God says to Abraham, move, he moved, no questions asked. And that was credited to him as righteousness. Will you let him lead you where he wants you to go? Will you let him remake you and rework you so that he can use you? You see, let me illustrate. There's a story about this uh, airplane engineer who was, um, uh, who was retired from uh, a place like Norton Drummond. And by the time he retired, he was one of the company's prominent CEO in the engine manufacturing division. You know, when they hired him, it seems that they hired him right out of college from uh, one of the Ivy League schools, Harvard University. And when they hired him, and after they decided to hire him, had the interview, they told him this. They said, look, we are glad you graduated from Harvard. To us, it proves that you're responsible and a committed young man. But you may as well know that there's nothing they've taught you that's going to help us. We're going to have to retrain you with the skills you need to work here. You see, this CEO had gone to Harvard for four years, and he studied hard, faithfully attended all of his classes, and yet, virtually, nothing he had learned there, they say, you know, matter of fact, we're going to have to make sure that you unlearn some of these things so we can actually use you. Nothing he learned there that And you think, wow, he went to Harvard. In the same way, it doesn't matter what strength you think you have. You think, God needs me, God, you know, going to use me. Because I got some skills, I got some talents, I'm going to bring that to the table. And others might think, I don't I have nothing to offer to God. I don't know what he really can do. I'm just going to live my life quietly and go away. No. It doesn't matter how skilled you are, how rich, how powerful you are, those things don't impress God. You see, God isn't looking at your resume, so don't even bother writing one. He isn't looking at whether or not he can. You know, you have anything to offer to him. He's just looking at whether he can trust you to do what he wants done and to go where he wants you to go. If God says this, you know, you worry about it. Well, how is it going to work out? You have to ask all these questions. All God wants to know is if he asks you to do something, will you do it? You know, without saying, well, I'm not going to, you know, you hesitate. You trust him enough to go where he sends you and do what he asks. And so the first thing God, God's covenant with Abram should teach us is, if God makes a promise, we can trust him to keep it. You see, faith is when we trust God to do exactly what he's promised. If he's made a promise, he's able, more than able, to deliver above and beyond what we can imagine. We were out on the streets of Portland and witnessing to people, and I had a conversation with this one man. He had a lot to say, and I didn't. I just listened, you know, and uh, he went on and on about purgatory. <laughs> and, uh, and about the people who are stuck in there, you know, for thousands and thousands of years. I lost track, track of what he was saying about three or four minutes into the conversation. I was just saying, hopefully you get out of this train of thought and move on. As I, and I was thinking about this verse in Romans chapter uh, 4, verse 21 to 22, about that time, you know. Just that you know, if you're talking to me and it looks like I'm drawing a blank, um, there's a good chance that you uh, triggered my thinking about something else entirely different. And, and uh, in, in, in this case, a, a verse from the Bible, four, Romans 4, 21 to 22. It says, Abraham was fully persuaded that God has power to do what he has promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. Ask yourself that question. You know, if that's true in your life, does God have the power enough to do what he's promised already? You know, Abraham believed God, that God had the power to do what he had promised. 
And that's what it's all about. I gotta ask myself that question as you, as you do. Do I believe that God will deliver on his promises? Even though it seems like it's not gonna happen until I put in a whole lot of effort in that direction. In fact, that's exactly what the, uh, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6. It says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists. And he rewards those who extremely, uh, earnestly seek him. You see, faith is believing that God will do what he's promised you. He will do it. Now, the second thing that we can learn from this promise in Genesis 12 is, this covenant with Abraham, you know, is a covenant of the Bible. All other promises and covenants of the Bible seem to hinge upon this guarantee God made him. For example, God promised Abraham saying, and the Bible references uh, Genesis 12, 3, where it says, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. You see, in this God was telling Abraham, I'll take care of you. You know, sometimes we worry about all the things that people can, you know, bad things that can happen because of people. Or, you know, and we're afraid to even bless some people because of people. Oh, I don't want to give it all away. People will curse you and people will bless you. But God's saying, I always have you back. I heard this one Bible theologian who seems to be, he had the opinion that that promise that I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. Uh, he was of the opinion that God, uh, uh, that promise was only for Abraham. It puzzled me a little bit. So I did a little Bible study and I discovered that that theologian was absolutely wrong in, that, in what he said. Uh, for example, uh, the Bible talks about it in Matthew chapter 10 verse 42. Jesus says, if anyone gives a, even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones because he's my disciple, I tell you the truth. He will certainly not lose his reward. In other words, he's saying, I will bless those who bless you. In the Bible reference of 2 Thessalonians verse 1, verse 6, Paul, uh, chapter 1, verse 6, Paul says, God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you. In other words, God will curse those who curse you. Somebody bringing up, hey, giving you a hard time, making your life difficult. You know, don't worry about taking care of that thing or taking care of that individual. You have a vindicator. You have God Almighty on your side who will take care of it better than you ever can. Yeah. In other words, God will curse those who curse you. In short, God will bless those who bless you and he will curse those who curse you. You see, you and I have the same promise Abraham did because this is a promise God has made to all of us. Amen? Once again, let me emphasize that the promise was made to Abraham because God knew that he would experience trouble in this world. And God wanted uh, to drive home the fact uh, you know, that he loved this man so much that he would protect him. And Jesus tells us, Christians, he says, in this world you'll have trouble. But take heart, you're going to have some problems, you're going to have some issues, you're going to have some, you know, terrible things happen. But don't go, you know, you know, get all worried about it, troubled about it. There's nothing I can't handle. I can handle it. Like the, like Lazarus in the tomb. He's thinking, never mind. I can still handle the situation. No situation is beyond his handling capability. He's able to handle it. So, in this world you'll have trouble, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. Same promise, same God. You see, God makes this promise to us because we, like Abraham, are now covenant people. We are the people God has made His promises to. You might ask, but why? Why are we a covenant people? What makes us so special that God would make us promises like those He made to Abraham? What makes us so special? The answer is Jesus. That's the only reason. It's only by the blood of Jesus that we have the promises from God. Nothing that you did or I did or anyone did you can warrant us those promises. And this goes to the heart of what I want to tell you, see. The promises of God made for Abraham in Genesis pointed ultimately to Jesus. And the Bible references Galatians chapter 3, verse 16. Here Paul says, the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed, singular. 
The scripture does not say, and to seeds, meaning many people. He says, unto your seed, meaning one person, who is Christ. You see, Abraham was chosen by God uh, to be the beginning of a long line of descendants that ultimately led to Jesus. So, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 1, right off the back, verses 1 and 2, it says, A record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the, the father of Judah, uh, and his brothers. And it goes on. See, God began Christ's genealogy in, in Matthew with Abraham. And one of the reasons God did this was so he could set up a paper trail for Christ. It was a paper trail that began with Abraham, but was re-emphasized over and over again to Christ, uh, you know, uh, um, his moral ancestors, if you will. If you were to research the lives of the people who were part of Jesus' ancestry in Matthew, you'd find that over and over again, God promised several of them that the promised Messiah was coming through their lineage. It was Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, goes on. It was a deliberate paper trail. Now the question is, why would that be important? Well, about 500 years before Jesus Christ was manifested, a man named Siddhartha was born. You and I know, better know him as Buddha. For centuries before uh, Buddha was born, nobody ever said someone like Buddha is coming. Nobody ever prophesied that a man like Buddha would live and teach and die as he did. And nobody ever said these would be his parents, his grandparents, or his great grandparents or anything. Buddha just popped up in history and talked the things he taught and became the founder of the Buddhist religion. But 500 years after Jesus, there was another person came in, into, into the scenario. Muhammad. Muhammad was born. Centuries before Muhammad was born, nobody ever said someone like Muhammad is coming. Nobody ever prophesied that a man like Muhammad would live and teach and die as he did. And nobody ever said these would be his parents, or his grandparents, or his great grandparents. Muhammad just popped up in history, taught the things he taught, and, and became the founder of the religion Islam. But by contrast, when Jesus was born, there are already been you know, centuries of prophecies about how he would live and teach and die and be raised on the third day. That was already established. And Abraham became the linchpin of that long line of descendants that ultimately led to Jesus Christ. That long line of descendants is one of the major proofs that God had planned this all out. It was God's paper trail proving that Jesus wasn't just another world religious leader. He was the one sent by God. Yeah. Now one more thing. The promise given Abraham did not just point to the coming of Jesus. God promised to him pointed to the foundation of what Jesus came to do. So the Bible says that in Matthew chapter 1, uh, God makes it so that the genealogy of Christ starts with Abraham. Now the question is, why not just start with Adam? Or, you know, because he's the first man. Or even uh, Noah, you know, or, or one of his sons. They started the human race after the flood. No, God kicks, uh, kicks off this Christ's uh, genealogy with Abraham. God picks up, picks up a man born about 300 years after Noah died. Why? Because Abraham, I hope you get this, if you got nothing else out of this, hopefully you get this. Abraham did nothing to deserve God's promises. Abraham was not chosen because he was a great writer, or a great soldier, or a prominent theologian or a powerful leader, there's only one reason God chose Abraham, and the Bible says in Romans chapter 4, verse 9, Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. You and I don't have to be a person of any prominence, but we can have faith. We can trust in God to be truthful, to be uh, to having his promises delivered. He'll make true all of his promises and but says are amen in Christ. Meaning Abraham was chosen because he was willing to trust God. And if it was his willingness to believe God